does having a bigger stadium make Sunderland a bigger club than Fulham? No. Sunderland may well be a bigger club than Fulham. Well, they've got a bigger stadium than probably Chelsea, don't but they? But it's not the point. Yeah. The stadium is really relevant. Luke, uh, despite that, you've got an email. I've got an email from Andy, who I hope is a patron. If not, he's got no, absolutely no business being here. But we're giving the benefit of the doubt <laughs> for now. It could be Andy Brassel, we just don't know. He could be. He asks the following. As a show that famously enjoys the use of an algorithm, think Luke and his penalty shootout formula, oh, which yeah. has proven over the test of time to that be sometimes right. absolutely spot on. Um, 60% of the time works every time. <laughs> Alex says, I wanted to ask, what makes a big club, in your guy's opinion? And specifically, what makes one club bigger than the other? There's recent history... For example, make Manchester City bigger than Arsenal? Does entire history make Preston a bigger club than Crystal Palace? Mm. Does having a bigger stadium make Sunderland a bigger club than Fulham? And does being in a higher league make Bournemouth a bigger club than Leeds? Some helpful examples there from Andy. I think we all know what he's getting at. This is a question that some of the more one-eyed sections of, say, fan media like to dine out out on quite Mm -hmm. a lot, particularly when they see perhaps nouveau riche clubs coming through and winning things and they use it as a way to comfort themselves, don't they? Like a Leeds United fan will say, yeah, yeah, you've won the treble Man City, Mm -hmm. but actually in the 70s, we did all this stuff and look at our fan base and all the rest of it. So it's an interesting one to unpick from the point of view of three fairly neutral, old-fashioned gentlemen, Mm. (laughs) perhaps operating in the the new media landscape. In our drawing room. (laughs) Yeah. So pull up a port and a cigar. I'm going to jump straight in there. Something that um, you, you, you touched on there is, I think size of the fan base Massively, it's, it's a huge it, thing. Yeah. Well, well, Andy, Andy also says, can the algorithm be consulted to ascertain who is the bigger club and put the incessant belly aching on Twitter to rest? I think the short answer to that specific part of the question is no. Yeah, absolutely. There is no algorithm. It's yeah, all or opinion. putting belly aching on Twitter no. to rest. Uh, well, you, you, you should yeah. be calling it X first and foremost. Yeah, indeed, it's disrespectful it's, to the musketeer. It is to do that. And, <laughs> and the musketeer is done for this. Yeah. yeah. Brand. yeah. Well, uh, imagine he was sat up all night thinking about that. Nothing's going to make Twitter shut the fuck up. Let's be absolutely no. clear about that. Not even, not even the musketeer. Not even rebranding it to X. Um, so there's no algorithm and there's no way we can put it to bed but it would be interesting to explore our opinions on it and Marcus you started off with fan base which is interesting well do we want Twitter to shut the fuck up because you know I think the reason why he rebranded it to X is X marks the banter it does it Um, is possible though that the the discourse on X will make us dumb down so entirely that we lose sentience altogether yeah so perhaps it will Uh, shut down I've got my fingers crossed Jim (laughs) (laughs) but I think to, to go back to your point Marcus about the size of the fan base I think that in the most fundamental sense of it that is a huge huge part of it because essentially it comes down to how many people care Mm -hmm. about what X team for want of a better phrase does like it's it's a form of entertainment it's also a you Uh know it's a a community asset a football club is a lot of different things at once how many people's lives are impacted by it Uh is 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 one of the most fundamentally kind of important things about Mm -hmm. how you kind of measure the size of a club like words like size and big don't even necessarily apply it's quite a nebulous concept this isn't it oh I know people who are massive fans of non-league football like our mate um, Chris yeah he'll he'll, he'll be really genuinely excited and be like oh you know Chesham are away to Fisher Athletic next week massive club it's Uh going to be huge but on the fan base side of it though allow me to complicate this a little bit further because I think fan base is a nice place to start but what I would say is this you probably need to be more regionally specific you do because sure a Manchester City who I think are a big club regardless of the of the the nouveau reach element of them amazing history and everything like that they will now have a much bigger worldwide fan yeah. base than a lot of clubs yeah. that perhaps you might think mm. are bigger in mm-hmm. England. Well, I mean, and there's, so and it's not just the, about that. There are always examples you can chuck in and go, ah, but this. Mm. That for every single category, you will always be able to find a club. Yeah. Who's a bigger club, Nantes or Monaco? Mm. Yeah. Well, Monaco have had much you know, yeah. more success, you would say, and we're much more familiar. But, I mean, you know, how often do they still fill their stadium? I mean, Juventus, definitely one of the, a, a huge club. Yeah, you can always get tickets for Juventus games. Yeah. They tell them to sell out the stadium. But, of course, the, 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 the supportership is, is um, far and wide-reaching. Current status is something that people often don't take into account mm-hmm. of this. And, also, yeah, I mean, people, Manchester City people are really enormous. hate that Man City are enormous. Yeah. For obvious reasons. But they're and, an and elite they club. They are an elite club. And also... You can make history at any time, right? Yeah. This is the thing. People bring history into it a lot, and that, 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 that is, a, is, a, is a huge factor in it as well. But it, if success is happening now, it doesn't mean it doesn't count. It no. doesn't mean it doesn't matter for anything. You can sometimes have too much history. I mean, who's the biggest club on the South Coast? Wow, well, come on. No, well, come on. You wouldn't say it was Portsmouth. I would. Jim, 
You wouldn't say it was Portsmouth. I'd probably say it was Southampton. You would, but yeah. Portsmouth have won titles. Whereas yeah. they're the only club in the South Coast that yeah. have won the top flight in, so, so I think in England. If I can answer that in the, in the most neutral way I'm capable of doing it, which probably yeah. isn't that neutral, I would say that sometimes it's a confusion that Southampton is a bigger city than Portsmouth, which it is, and Southampton have had more years in the Premier League That's where than it comes Portsmouth, from, sure. which they have. Yeah. But by every other measure... Mm-hmm. They're not a bigger club than Portsmouth. Southampton have got a better stadium. It depends what you mean by better. It's slightly, slightly bigger. Yeah, it's, it's definitely. It's a fucking shithole. It's a proper <laughs> new. It's, it's better. It's a new. But it, but it, but what? Do you, but that's a completely subjective, view, subjective viewpoint. Because mm. here's what I'm saying. Right. You know, there's no there's no leaks. Would you say that? I mean, would you? Is Wembley Stadium a better the, stadium? The toilets than, flush at Southampton. You don't know what you're talking about, <laughs> mate. This is the thing. This is what you've got to be. This is why it's impossible to be to be kind of um, clear eyed about it. Mm. I, I, when I went to answer these these questions, this question, I kind of thought about the things that I personally felt were important to ascertain what a big club is and what it isn't. And I think yeah. when we were using Man City as that example earlier, I think a better example is probably Chelsea, because their record pre Abramovich, mm-hmm. you know, was was pretty poor. Yeah, it was FA pretty, Cups here and there. Yeah, pretty. Well, it pretty, wasn't, pretty, it wasn't pretty, poor. It wasn't what it was when a, Abramovich took over. There's a paucity of of, of support and trophies consistently etc etc it's a big discrepancy mm. my, my 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 touch points for this question were history of trophies and kind of contribution to the overall game size of fan base which you guys have covered yeah amount of things won in total yeah which i think should be seen as relevant to the size of club they are so i don't think it's you can't just say oh well you know fucking oxford united never won the champions league so they're not mm. a big club I mean, you, mm. you have to into the milieu and then the cultural imprint as well I thought was important so the cultural imprint is is, is something that um, that I was going to say and to make it sound you know, and again look this is this is difficult to quantify but some people think it is uh, easy to quantify because you look at the trophies you look at maybe size of the stadium all that kind of stuff but I think it is the feeling that that club st- stirs absolutely I think if, if, if you know we've, we on, on yesterday's ramble we talked about Ajax and we're like, well, having a bit of a piss boss, but it's still a glamorous name. Ajax will be a glamorous name mm. for, for a long time. Say AC Milan. Well, who's a bigger club, AC Milan or Chelsea? Well, Chelsea have had um, more success um, in European football in, in in more recently. But AC AC Milan, you know, and so it depends. Maybe what but AC Milan you... have won an incredible amount of European. Yeah. Cup. They have, of course. Um, so so I, it, it it is a tricky one. I mean, um, Andy mentioned. Um, Preston North End, of course, who have, have won top titles. You know, Fulham have never won a major tournament, uh, major trophy in their histories. I often bang on about um, who is a bigger club there. You know, I, and so I, I think current status is also something that yeah. few people take into account. We talked about when Forest were down in the Championship and they eventually got promoted. There was a lot of people, especially our age and maybe a little bit older, mm. or definitely a bit older. Oh my goodness, it's nice to have them back because we remember. Mm. Some people will not remember. Yeah. They go, "Who gives a damn if they won the European Cup in the late seventies? There will be a lot of people, who young and old, but damn. definitely young, who won't care. So the, this this is an interesting um, point. With Forest in particular, I think, because Forest are a really good example of how you might have parameters of what makes a big club traditionally, but they can be outperformed. Um, the, in the grand scheme, Forest don't have anywhere near as many supporters as a, as a lot of teams do, but the achievements that they've had has mm-hmm. stamped their mark on the very fabric of the game. And as, as, totally. as you've touched on, I think trophies and, and, and what a club wins are essentially their it's impact the that they've had on the, the game itself. It's the currency. And, and, and their contribution to the story of the sport. Which is why I don't think, because it's intrinsic, that what people, what teams have won is intrinsic and it's the currency that we all enjoy the game in. Yeah. You know, it's just the whole point of it for yeah. the players and yeah, for yeah. the managers. And which is why I don't think, conversely, to, to go back to Andy's question, does having a bigger stadium make Sunderland a bigger club than Fulham? No. Sunderland may well be a bigger club than Fulham. Well, they've got a bigger stadium but than it, probably Chelsea, don't but they? It, it's not the point. Yeah. The stadium is irrelevant. I mean, because... Well, it's not irrelevant. I think it is, but <clears> I'll tell you what, let me, let me explain that. It's irre- if, you were, if you were really going to look about a, 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 a factor in this question, which is match-going fans, mm-hmm. I think that's fine. I think you can... And you've mentioned that with Juventus as an example, yeah. right? Whether a wealthy owner mm. built you a stadium or not, mm. it to me is entirely r- irrelevant. Well, it, it's not irrelevant. It can be irrelevant. With say like the example of of Monaco, even though their stadium is quite small, but the fact is they don't they don't fill it 
but it can be relevant if you have to build a bigger stadium because an awful lot of people want to watch you because you're a huge club and therefore you've got to expand and you can expand. Hmm. You know, in our lifetimes, we've seen Old Trafford expand. I mean, people say they should get a bloody new stadium. But Manchester City, again, yeah. obviously Arsenal as well, move stadium. Arsenal, Arsenal right now playing in, um, you know, at Highbury, it seemed it would seem yeah, it would be too odd. small, wouldn't yeah, it? Yeah, absolutely. You know, and and Chelsea, how you know they've been looking? They want to build a stadium on top of Waterloo Station, which any, anybody listening to this knows what was is utterly ridiculous. Oh, or Battersea Power Station, another Pompey wanted to do one in the harbour at Portsmouth, which is incredible. That floating was, that was a piss take. Yeah, they, they did. They wanted to. Yeah, no, oh, int- intriguing. So strange that didn't happen. Very mm. strange. Yeah. I, can't, I couldn't imagine that it going. Sounded wrong. a bit like System of a Down but, there. But if we were, <laughs> but, but, but if we relate like stadium and fan, but the reason I'm saying this is because and, you know, obviously I don't I was, think it's a clinching factor, but I think it depends. So I don't think to say it's irrelevant. But, 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 is but it's an indication of how many people care, right? It comes back into yes. the size of the fans. So look at Newcastle United and Sunderland and, and, and a lot of those teams up in the northeast that, that fill their stadium wherever they are. Mm. I mean, to be fair to Man City, they took a lot of fans when they were down the third tier. They yeah, still they have did. fans. Leeds United is another good example. Another one. The reason I know you're being kind of slightly mischievous when you're talking about Southampton, but if you look at Southampton's attendances when they dropped out the Premier League. They're far lower than Portsmouth yeah, no, 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 in League so, One. So, the, so there is that. But, so you've got to factor it all in. You do. But but you mentioned um, the word regional uh, earlier. You know, we, we talk about Premier League clubs. We talk about all this in big big clubs. Rangers and Celtic are bigger than most English clubs. Agree. I th- and I don't think anybody would yeah. disagree with that, really. But you don't think about it because they play in a league which is inferior to the Premier League. Yeah, totally. But that's why if Rangers and Celtic moved into the Premier League, which I don't think should happen, and that was a chat from, from years ago, you know, that would have been interesting to see what would have happened there. But Celtic are a great example, Marcus, because... Yeah. And they have won the European It's about Cup. cultural imprint. Yep. It's about them being the first British team to win the European That's Cup. That's right. Yeah. In, uh, six, was it 67, I think? Is that right? I think it was. Yeah. Yeah, I'm yeah. pretty sure it was 67. Yeah. Man United won it the year, year after. after yeah. Um, and the size of fan base, obviously huge, because mm-hmm. culturally they have a very yeah. strict, like quite a very kind of prominent identity. Yeah. Um, and... And everyone in Europe will be familiar with. So something. they tick all those boxes. The four, the four kind of quite arbitrary categories that I came up with when I was thinking about this was, like I said, history of trophies. So they've got that contribution to the game, size of fan base, huge, cultural imprint, very, very big, um, and amount of things run in total. Again, partly because they're in a slightly inferior league, of course, but that's also part of it. So, mm-hmm. so I, I think you also go if you go to, I wonder if you go to South America, mm. for example. And you speak to someone who's you know about you know maybe our parents' age or whatever, and ask them about Celtic, they know who they are. They would. Well, I thought so. Yeah. So that's you, in, in, in Nigeria, they know, or Lagos, certainly, they know who Dundee United are. Quite of easily. Of course. Absolutely. It's an insult in Lagos. I know it is. Exactly. Do your own research, everybody. But yeah, yeah, it's true. I think, so how much do we think history and sort of legacy comes into it in a sense? Because one of the great things about football is that the clubs we support were there for a long, long time before us mm-hmm. and will be there for a long, long time after us as well. And unless it's do, RB Leipzig, Jim. Hmm. Unless it's RB Leipzig, yeah. Uh, but, it, it, you know, and uh, you do have unfortunate cases where clubs go out of business, of course. But I think the weight of those past achievements does matter because traditions are, are kind of passed along through generations yeah. in, in, in songs in the grounds and things like that. But I think the past glories that teams have had, mm-hmm. it sets the tone of the club, the standards of the club, what, mm-hmm. could, what could be achieved. And it's also, it's kind of the standard that each new player aspires to yep. you know and that, that history mm-hmm. as we've touched on can be made at any time but at some clubs the expectation is different from others and that comes from the history and that yeah. again informs the size of the club you're I right argue. you're right but that history does sometimes you know and it's a ridiculous thing to say but it does in terms of its impact it does have a sell-by date or it does fade oh, absolutely of course. sure of course, torino for example yeah yeah, yeah. Blackburn yeah. rovers won loads of stuff in the yeah, 19th much century more yeah. contemporary um uh, yeah. uh, you know or, you know i was going to go for Provercelli next yeah um you know so so there is all that i think in, in terms of arguing who's a bigger club arsenal or man city and all the rest of it I, yeah, that's so for much your YouTubers that that's for you exactly exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, a lot of it down for, to your own sort of interpretation and feeling and, 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 and all that kind of stuff as well a friend of mine once asked me if Arcade Fire were bigger than Arsenal and I don't even I don't know how to I don't know how I would, to answer I, that I like where he's going with that question but I don't think they are I don't think they are I don't think they could sell out 60,000 every week a Man City bigger than Hula Hoops <laughs> um, next question not for Jim. me who, who, question. Hula Hoops aren't as big, big as they were are they 
Yeah, next question. So again, the next question. I, I hope Alex feels. So I hope Andy feels like we've kind of explored that at least. It's impossible to answer, yeah. of course. And most mailbag shows of this type wouldn't go in for those kind of questions because they're impossible to answer. Mm. But we'll give it a good discussion. We have. We sh- we will. We'll, we'll try and knock up an al- algorithm and then not share it with you. <laughs> yeah. So uh, Alex has been on touch on X and and asks if you were a manager, are there any radical tactics you would employ to psych out your opponent within the laws of the game? Of course, <laughs> I'm convinced that keeping four players on the halfway line when defending corners and using no when defending a direct free kick would both work. Now, interestingly, mm. um, goalkeepers stopped using walls against Janino Panambacawa, didn't they? Because he was... Um, Panambacano, p- yeah. Sorry, Panambacano, of course. Um, because he was such a good free kick taker that yeah. the wall was just getting in so, the line of sight. But that is a slightly unique So I, I, I wanted to e- explore one of Alex's suggestions that it was indeed that, that wall thing. I want to explore the other one, but go on. We'll yeah, you, you can go on that and yeah. say. I, mean, I genuinely think beyond a certain <clears throat> distance it's less beneficial to have a wall there. Yeah. And the reason for that is I think if you if you go if you're fortunate enough to go and watch a game in person and there's a top goalkeeper there, the one that always sticks in my mind is Allison. You see Allison play in the flesh. His presence is unbelievable. Mm-hmm. But it is like yeah. something even if you've played football to a fairly decent kind of amateur level, you will have never experienced goalkeeping at the level anywhere near what Allison is capable of in terms of athletic ability, technique, mm-hmm. presence, charisma, leadership, all that kind of stuff. It's a completely different mm-hmm. world. And I remember seeing Allison play in the flesh. I forget who it was against now, but I was quite near the goal. I'll tell you it was. I think it might have been when I was at Craven Cottage watching them when they threw with Liverpool the, two, two, yeah, yeah. the season. Yeah. And I just remember thinking, you are going to... I mean, I'm talking about maybe a, go- a free kick, direct free kick, maybe, tw- maybe 20... Eight to 30 yards out. It's quite far. I think it's going to need to be something very special indeed to get past Allison. And I don't think a wall makes a scrap of difference because you're far enough out to get it over and worn down uh-huh. again. That's really the challenge. For those people who don't really know much about that kind of thing, the, the closer in you get, the harder it is to get it up and down over the wall. Yeah. You have to put enough whip and enough elevation to get it up over the guys who jump and then down again. And the closer you're in, it's harder to do that. The further out, it's easier to do that. I don't think the wall becomes that much of a problem when you're further out. Mm. I, I just think what it does is it gives a goalkeeper like Allison yeah. less chance to see it. But this is which this is, is which is in a disadvantage to him. So I think Alex is spot on. Well, this is a, with that. It is a tactic that or a thing to do which has been discussed by this before. I think the four players on the halfway line is more radical because I've never seen it, and uh, I don't think there's any benefit to that at all. Well, what's the benefit? Well, I, because you could obviously break. And do do they leave? Um, more players back then, so they have... So it becomes a bit of a game of bluff. Yeah. It does a bit, yeah, because of course, well, they've got fewer attackers in the box, but you've got fewer defending players in the box. You know, I would have thought that it wouldn't work ultimately because an attacking team, I think if there's fewer players in the box for a corner, that benefits the attacking team. Too much, yeah. Yeah, you you want to make it congested no, so people I, can't run. And... I think it works, thinking about it, because if you leave four players... Depends who you've got, though. If you've got, if you've got defenders who are towering over everybody and win every header... But the reason that goalkeepers don't claim as much is because the penalty area is so oh, crowded. Yeah, there is that. So if you, if you take four that. out and then the other team call your bluff and go out there with you, you've got eight fewer players in the penalty area, which means the goalkeeper oh, yeah, there can, is that. can basically claim a lot more than they currently do. So, and if they do, the goalkeeper then can distribute and get them on, get yeah. them going. And also, you would presumably the attacking team would, would probably just play short and then you've got four players busting a gut to get back. You True. potentially have a lot of gaps opening up uh, there. It's interesting. If, but if you, are, if you were attacking... And in, so you, the opposition have got four and a half on and you could just go, brilliant, we've got more attackers in the box. Yeah, sure. So it could, it could fall foul. Um, in terms of radical tactics, there's not, not, not too much that I could um, think of myself that Pep Guardiola hasn't already done. Sure. Um, you know, five up front across the... You he know, learned a lot of that from you to start with, though, didn't he? So I'd like to think so, Jim. I'd like here. to think so. But is there any radical tactics that anybody else thought? Radical is maybe not what I would, um, <laughs> how I would describe it, but quite often you see you know and as we always have in football players get wound up by the antics of the opposition and, mm-hmm. and things are saying, saying to them and like shirt pulls and things yeah. that are very very clearly designed to mm-hmm. wind players up I would I would try to instill in my players that you just ignore everything the opposition do just so completely ignore apparently. them like they're not there yeah just be completely blank and yes. sort of quite robotic act like they're not even there I yeah. think yeah, 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 at yeah. first it would look a bit superior and a bit arrogant and that might wind people up by the end of the game, it mm. would seem psychotic Jim, and it might yeah. actually be frightening. I completely agree with you. That was always my th- my thing whenever I played. Just, just ignore. 
because the opposition they, that, like they hate it. Well, it's wasted energy as well. Isn't Completely, it? yeah. And and that's what I've mentioned this before in the pod. That that's what Ian Wright used to say about yeah. Sol Campbell because he would be in the ears of defenders and he loved a bit of the chat, yeah. of course. Yeah. But he said Sol Campbell was one. He was just like a brick wall. Just couldn't, didn't even get any reaction from it. And he said, and it would wind him up. Mm. Ian Wright said, you know. And so I think I think that's a, that's a so. Good so point. I would I would add that um, that I think with I don't think with <laughs> yeah we recorded the show yesterday with Liverpool. Blitzed Sparta Prague eleven two on aggregate, and the and the discrepancy between the haves and the have nots in football is mm. is you know big and getting bigger. I don't think we're I don't think we're that far away from a situation where, for example, Manchester City are playing an unfancied team in a knockout stage of the Champions League, uh-huh. or say they have a disaster in the Champions League and they end up going to the Europa, right? Yeah. And they're playing the quarterfinal against someone you know average. They're playing FC Copenhagen they play or Carabag or someone like yeah. that, right? And in the second leg, they haven't been able to break through or whatever, and it's nil nil in aggregate, and there's ten minutes left. I don't think <clears> it's a huge stretch to say Guardo that might take the goalkeeper off and bring another player out. And can I, you do that? I don't know, but if you can, uh-huh. I think he would like to do it <laughs> because surely because just because he, it sounds mad, uh-huh. but if you look at the numbers, there will be periods of time across because Premier League do this stats all the time when you're watching the broadcast. Five minutes, last five minutes possession. Yeah. Sometimes Man City is ninety five. You, don't, you don't actually need to take the goalkeeper off. Yeah. They always talk about Edison. Just like get Absolutely him involved no, in the midfield. But, 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 uh, but he's already doing that. No, not, not to the not, extent that you're talking. Not about. Not in the way an outfield player would. And people, no. as you say, people often say about Edison, he's so good he could play in midfield. And um, we we don't know. That I don't sure, but true, we know he's excellent. I, with his no, but I think I think you, I think that tactic. Not for Man City. No, if I may try and actually add some some sort of seriousness to it. If you did have Edison, if Manchester City... Just there we, to recycle passes, right? There. Nothing complicated. Exactly. So if you are, as the good teams do, like to squeeze the play and basically play in the opposition half, if you add another player... Exactly, it's massive. You're basically asking them to score from like 70 or 80 yards. They they're not getting the ball. Exactly. And they won't have a time to do that anyway. Yeah. My, uh, my suggestion is quite radical. It's been done before. Not for many, many years for obvious reasons. But um, one of the dads who used to come and play, uh, watch us play uh, always wanted to do what he called the Scunthorpe Rush. Now, I mentioned oh, this yeah, many I years ago yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> on the Ramble. And he reckoned Scunthorpe did it. But a team who did do it was Scotland. Reading the, the 1970, how a, how a Country Lost the World Cup book, which is yeah. a really good read under Ali McLeod, mm. who was very charismatic and mm. yeah, he, was, he was mad. Um, but he got them all going for a bit. And they did, I think it was against Czechoslovakia in a, in a qualifier. So he tried to do this. And they all rushed him. And Explain what, to them what people what it actually is. It's you, you you take kickoff and you launch the ball into one of the channels, basically at one of their fullbacks, and you've got everybody lined up on the halfway line and you just pile in. You just rush them. And apparently, according to the one of the dads, as I say, who came to uh, to watch us uh, play, because his son used to play, obviously. Um Scunthorpe did this in an FA Cup tie and it panicked. He reckoned it was against Liverpool. <laughs> now, I'm not sure that was true, but, but anyway, he, he panicked the fullback to go out ah, and, and loses the ball and you're all already there. You've got everyone there and they scored. So, from you, it. You, you could, so that isn't as well. Ridiculous. Let me tell you what happened to Scotland because they tried to do that and the Czech, or whoever it was, it was a Czech fullback, just looked at it and was like, what? Knocked the ball over the top and Czechoslovakia hit the post. They nearly scored from it because it's right. so easy to defend against, of course. Well, I think if you, if you were a team who was decent, yeah. better than the other team, and you were somehow in like a cup game. It's the you ultimate said, press. You found yourself like a goal down, yeah. and you needed to do something in the last minute. I mean, it wouldn't be the worst idea in the world. Yeah, but you've essentially given the ball away, so nowadays... Not I if you they're... absolutely hammer it and they're not expecting <laughs> yeah. it. You've got some really quick players. It is really a, a really weird bastardization of the press, yeah. is basically what it Killian, is. Killian, get yourself up there, son. <laughs> <laughs> Hit if the you, channel. If you've got someone who can kick it Kick it high enough, essentially, to buy you the time. Like, like a rugby up and yeah, under. Exactly. Yeah. The up and under is exactly right. You got to be, you you got to find a way to get it up high and get it coming down in a particular place. You're on board, Jim. Yeah, yeah, you I like are, that, Jim. You're on board. Love to see Arsenal do that in the title clinch at the end of the season. <laughs> <laughs> All or nothing. Beautiful. Uh, write this from Tarek on email. It says watching Barcelona take on Napoli this week, I was blown away by their new young defender, Gabasi, who turned 17, yes, 17 in January, but was named player of the match. I would like to hear from you guys. When was a time that a young player really took you aback and made you think this guy's going to be a world beater? I'm even more interested to hear about the ones that didn't make it. Good question. Very good. Um, I mean, the obvious couple that did, uh, Michael Owen and Wayne Rooney. Mm. I, I think, remember Rooney's goal because it was against Arsenal. Of course. Exactly. And then obviously... He, Owen against uh, Wimbledon it was. Yeah. Away from they were both... They it, That was a good example of 
players who were just coming from nowhere. I think with Rooney, I remember hearing a couple of rumours, but obviously the, the world wasn't as connected as it is now. But I do remember people talking about him. Um, I remember Robbie Fowler bursting onto the scene. And, and it was like they hadn't had to make any kind of leap into first uh-huh. team football at all at the very top yeah. level. I mean, Wayne Rooney said himself, didn't he? He's, all the players he thought were his heroes at Everton, he started training with them and he thought they were rubbish. Yeah. Um, These are crap. Yeah. <laughs> Michael Owen was just sp- really looking back on it, which is pure pace and finishing, really. He gets yeah. a lot of credit for his pace, Owen, but he was a good finisher as well, of course. Mm. And they did really do it. I mean, uh, Rooney in, in Euro 2004, Michael Owen's apotheosis would have, have been. You, have you got any. World Cup, not yet, against yeah. Argentina. I've got one. Everyone knows about those. I've got one that didn't make it. A um, bunch of us used to go to Fratton Park every week and there was a player back then would have been about 20 plus well, definitely 20 plus years ago now Peter Crouch? No, it wasn't him uh, There's was a player called uh, Lewis Buxton who, who was a centre back for Portsmouth and he made his debut at 17 and he was a man grown he was on the Grand Ricks at the time so that will date it for those of you out there who know when Grand Ricks managed Pompey I can't remember just before Harry Redknapp uh, and he looked amazing he was brilliant he was he was like Baracy. It was yeah. unbelievable. And people were ju- genuinely excited. Like Pompey didn't really produce that many players then. And it was like, this guy's got it. Like he's going to be amazing. And we mm-hmm. couldn't believe he was 17. Um, Harry Redknapp came in, didn't like him, um, put him out on loan to Bournemouth. How uh... times change. And he helped Bournemouth win the league, whatever league they're in now, but it was one below Portsmouth, I think. And then um, he ended up having a quite a good career at Sheffield Wednesday and in the lower leagues. And he didn't disgrace himself at all. He had a very good professional career. But he looked like the player that you were going to go, wow, he could go for big money to a Premier League club, you know? Yeah. But it never quite happened for him. But he was a very, very good player to watch. Yeah, I, I remember when I first saw David Beckham and it was when they got beat 3-0 by Aston Villa. Now, he'd had a few appearances for Manchester United mm. by the time. I hadn't, hadn't really clocked him. But he scored. The only Manchester United goal that 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 game. Yeah. And part of the Beckham myth. Sorry to cut yeah. you, Marcus, but part of the Beckham myth is that um, the first time anyone noticed him was when he scored from the halfway line against Wimbledon. It's not true, is it? No, no, there was, not there true. There was a lot before that. That got yeah. him to cross over into non-football fan mm. circles, basically. Exactly. Yeah. But the, but the goal that he scored against Aston Villa it was a consolation, but it was an absolute pinger. And from distance. It was from distance, yeah. And yeah. and it, it, it really stood out for a, a few friends of mine and I for some reason. I think and I so, remember the one you mean. Yeah, and uh and we would sort of um we we would we would often talk about oh yeah, Beckham what you know, what a right foot he had and and like if you scored a long range of yourself, oh, I was a bit of a Beckham and all that. Yeah. And this was, you know, way before, so obviously, you know, he would go on to do what he would do. I have a couple of ones though, um that ones that didn't make it. Spurs fans may remember Dean Marnie. Yes. Yeah. Dean Marnie, when he played early on in his career, now he'd probably been about 20 at the, at the time, he played for Spurs and he scored an absolute peach. I forget. Busy it was midfielder. Against, yeah. yeah. Was, was, it, was it against Everton, maybe? A long he, ranger. Yeah. Looping. And he looked it. amazing. It sounds like a knockoff Wayne Rooney, doesn't it? Yeah, 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 totally. Yeah. yeah. And I, I, I remember at that point going, oh my God, look at the way he's taken that goal, the technique, everything. He's going to be brilliant. Now, he had a very respectable career. Hull City and um, Burnley, I think it was. Um, but didn't quite go on. And then a Fulham one would be Kerim Fry, who was a tricky winger, very quick. Um, and when he was playing, I remember Rio Ferdinand once tweeting at, at uh, when, when Fry came on in a game, going, wow, this Fry guy, he, he looks an absolute player. He was so quick, so exciting. But it just didn't really no, happen. Yeah. didn't really happen. I think there's, there's a few of those that... Um, that I remember some of which show me that I was quite idealistic and just happy to be excited for a bit of tricky footwork. I really thought Wayne Routledge might go on to be something quite special yeah. just because when he, he, was, career, when he was young, he did have a good career. Michael Johnson would be another yeah. one at Man yeah, City. Obviously. He's a famous retired case, for very, yeah. very sad reasons, but when he first kind of broke through, this was, if I remember rightly, was in the sort of the Gerard Lampard era. And I thought this, this is something really different from a, from a midfield player that England might call on in the future. Cause he looked like he was a real, real talent. And I think this he's an estate agent now, isn't he? Possibly. That it, was, that was certainly the, the, the rumor. Yeah. This may be, I may slightly be bending the parameters of the question here, but I really thought Johan Gorkuf was going to go on to be a mm. genuine superstar. Like yeah. the, as many people said at the time, the Zidane of his generation, a player with such incredible footwork, such silk. Uh-huh. And I thought we are watching what, one of the next like box office best players in the world he, coming he lo- through he here. He looked good as well, didn't he? He looked good. He looked fantastic. Yeah. I mean, like, you, you, I understand you, you've obviously put the caveat in there, but yeah, you're right. But he did have some moments though. Sure. Yeah. I mean, yeah. all yeah. these players have had good careers. 
True. Uh, we're going to finish uh, with a question from Ashley on X, which says, which England player do, do you boys wish had more caps for England? I know who you're going to say. Michael Carrick. Yeah, I knew you'd say Carrick. Yeah. And that's a fair shout. Steve Bruce, no caps for England. Do you know what? Very good. 19 goals in one season. Yeah. So um, And so much success. So he many was, trophy he was wins. brilliant player. So basically, Graham Taylor didn't really rate him, did he? And I found some quotes about that. So in 1987... Um, um, Bobby Robson told Graham Taylor who was his assistant at the time to give um, Steve Bruce the captaincy for an England B international against like Malta um, high stakes so um, <laughs> Taylor did it really reluctantly and, and Steve Bruce said that he said to him you're captain by the way but it's not my choice it's Bobby for me you'd never be captain <laughs> what? yeah poor old Graham and, Taylor's a good guy and he yeah, wasn't saying I that know, Terry Venables did offer him a cap um, but Bruce knew that it was because Brian Robson was his assistant and it was like a sympathy thing at 35. And he he's, uh, and quite, I think, you know, with a lot of dignity, said he'd rather not have a cap than have a sympathy one at the tail end of his career. Yeah. yeah. Oh, shame, show, shame Joe Barton didn't do the same. <laughs> <laughs> but you are, that's, that's a good mention of Steve Bruce. Incredible that he didn't have a, an England One name answer for you, Marcus? Um, Owen Hargreaves. Yeah, fair. Because I think at Injuries. that time, and you, probably why you picked Carrick as well, yeah. that he was the man who should have been playing in the centre midfield beside one of those guys. Yeah, that yeah. We all know. Not, who, who, whose name we should not mention. It's yes, like exactly. Voldemort. <laughs> Indeed. Well, thank you very much for listening to the Football Ramble Mailbag, part of the ACAST Creator Network. We're back on Monday with a brand new ramble. In the meantime, follow us on X, TikTok, YouTube and Instagram at Football Ramble and follow us on Spotify as well. Don't forget to become a member of our Patreon and our Discord and all that good stuff too for just $5 a month. Patreon.com forward slash Football Ramble. You can join the biggest, fastest, <clears throat> most energetic, exciting, growing bunch of football fans anywhere on the internet. And I'm in the Discord as well. So don't let that put you what off. What more do you want? Patreon.com forward slash Football Ramble for really roughly the price of one cup of coffee in, I'd say, prep. Five bucks, Jim? Yeah. That right? I think so. Why not? Yeah. Do it too, Cheers for watching another fantastic clip from the Football Ramble podcast. Make sure you click like on this video and subscribe to the channel, which means you will not miss a single upload.